Alhamdulillah, Hirul Adameen, was slot with Slam Al Rasulillah, while the Adihi, or Sahabihi, women were there. Alhamdulillah, this is now episode 17 of the podcast The Forward with myself, Mahdi Lak. And today, inshallah, we will be looking at the sixth hadith of Imam al Noe's collection of 40. And this is the hadith on the halal and the haram, or the lawful and the unlawful. So this hadith is on the authority of. Abi Abdullah Nu'man ibn Bashir, who said, uh, may Allah be pleased with, pleased with both of them, he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, the halal is clear and the haram is clear. And in between them, there are ambiguous matters which many people do not know. Whoever guards himself against ambiguous matters has secured his deen and his honor. And whoever falls into ambiguous into ambiguous matters will fall into the haram, like the shepherd who shepherds his flock around forbidden pasturage. He is certain to pasture his flock in it. Indeed, every king has his forbidden pasturage. Indeed, Allah's forbidden pasturage is the things he has forbidden, i.e. the things he has declared unlawful. Indeed, in the body there is a lump of flesh, which, when it is sound, the whole body is sound, and when it is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. Indeed, it is the heart. And this has been related by Imams al-Bukhari and Muslim. And the two sheikhs, Sheikh Mustafa al-Bagha and Sheikh Muhyiddin al-Mistu, who are the authors of this commentary called Al-Wafi, Fi Shar al-Arba'in al nawawiyyah they also mention that this hadith is found in the collections of Imam, uh, Imam Abu Dawood, uh, At-Tirmidhi, and Nasa'i and Ibn Majah. So it's in all six major books. The Shaykhs start off, as usual, with the importance of the Hadith, the Ahmiyat al-Hadith, and they say it is agreed upon, or the, the exalted position of this Hadith and its many benefits is agreed upon. For it is one of the Ahadith around which Islam revolves. A group of them, meaning a group of scholars, have said that it is a third, i.e. is a third of the religion. Abu Daud said it is, a, it is a quarter. Whoever looks at it properly will find that it actually comprises all of it. It comprises all of the religion. Because it includes an elucidation of the halal and the haram and that which is ambiguous, as well as that which rectifies and corrects the heart and that which corrupts it. And this necessitates knowledge of the rules of the or the rulings of the of the revealed law of the Sharia, its foundations, i.e., its usul, and its branches, its furu. And it is a foundation in having carefulness. And it is leaving off doubtful matters, i.e., wara. So before I go into the language of the hadith, I should mention that. If one wants a, a detailed commentary on this hadith, there is uh, Imam Ghazali's book, uh, Kitab al-Halal al-Haram, which is from the Ihya al muddin And alhamdulillah, by Allah's fadl and ni'mah, by Allah's uh, his grace and his blessings, I was able to translate this book about four years ago. It's available. I'll put a link below. You can order it. Uh, it's, it's published in Malaysia, but it's available in bookshops uh, in America and in uh, Britain. It's about it's over 230 pages, and Imam Al Ghazali, rahimahullah, he discusses this in depth, and he goes into the meaning of wara and carefulness and avoiding unlawful matters. And you'll see some notes from Imam Ghazali's book in this commentary as we go through it. Okay, the language of the hadith. So, the halal is clear, the haram is clear. Uh, this meaning the word in Arabic is is bayin, which means dahir, obvious, clear, and it is what. Allah and his messenger have given as a clear text or the Muslims have made consensus that something in and of itself is halal or something in and of itself is haram. And then the mushtabihat, these ambiguous matters, which is the plural mushtabih, is al-mushkil, i.e. that which is problematic, meaning there's no clarity as to whether it is halal or haram. La ya'lamuhunna, meaning that most people do not know it, meaning they don't know it's ruling. They don't know it's ruling because the evidences compete with each other and contest with each other. The, the evidences don't necessarily agree. And therefore, sometimes the matter resembles the halal, and sometimes the matter resembles the haram. Whoever guards himself against uh, ambiguous matters, it's like a shubahat, 
meaning that he distances himself from them. Meaning, this means that he puts between himself and every doubtful matter or every mushkila a protection, meaning some sort of barrier, something to protect him from that doubtful matter. Whoever does that has secured his deen and his honor, meaning he has sought security and, and freedom for his honor in terms of being in terms of defamation or being attacked or being slandered. And he's protected his deen from any deficiency or shortcoming. And this indicates that one is doing that which is connected to people and that which is connected to Allah, mighty and majestic. So because your honor is is is, is about your relationship with, with uh, between you and other people, whereas your deen that refers to your relationship with Allah. And then whoever falls into ambiguous matters, whoever falls into shubahat, meaning that he dares to or he has the audacity to engage in doubtful matters, i.e. that which could be halal, could be haram, it's not clear. That's what it means. When And then it says the word is himma, the forbidden pasturage, comes from the word, uh, sorry, himma, forbidden pasturage. This is mahmi, means protected. It is something that is forbidden for anyone other than the owners, such as territory or property and so forth. It is also said it is that which the Khalifa protects or his deputy in terms of territory that is permissible for the animals or the beasts belonging to the Mujahideen. So, so soldiers who are at war, they will have uh, their own uh, land that's designated for them, for, them for, their, for their riding beasts and so forth to pasture in. And no one else is allowed to use it. Yushik, meaning... You know, in the in the translation, it says he will certainly fall into it, meaning that he, that he will rush towards it, or he will come very close to it. That's the word yushik literally means the, the in in the uh, in the language, and yarta fihi, i that he will pasture in it, i that his animals, his livestock, and his cattle will eat from it, and they will reside in it, and spend time in it. The muharima are obviously the the, the disobedient things or the acts, actions of of disobedience that Allah the Exalted has declared unlawful. And then a mudra is also a lump of flesh, the size of what one puts in one's mouth. So that's a quick summary of the language. But obviously, one can refer to the translations for uh, to see the whole thing in one in one text. This is just a, this is just an explanation of a few terms that come up. And obviously, we're going to explain this as we go through the fiqh. So the fiqh of the hadith and what it guides towards. The first thing is that the halal is clear and the haram is clear, and between them are ambiguous matters. So, Imam al nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala, says, what this means is that things fall into three categories. There is the halal wadih, that which is clearly halal, and that is not hidden from anyone. The fact that it's halal is not hidden, such as eating bread, uh, speaking, walking, and so forth. And then there's that which is haram wadih, it is clearly haram, it's clearly unlawful, such as wine, fornication, and so forth. And then there are ambiguous matters. And what this means is that it's not clear as to whether they are halal or haram. And this is why, or for this reason, many people do not know them. As for the ulama, they know the ruling based on a text, either there's an ayah or there's a hadith that they know about, that most people do not know about, or analogy, meaning they can draw a ruling based on a similar situation. So, so if there's a clear text for one instance, if they find something that is similar, that is analogous, then they can draw the same ruling for it. Thus, if something wavers, it goes back and forth between the halal and the haram. We don't know what it is. It could be halal, it could be haram. And there's no text. And there's no consensus. Meaning the, ulama, the Muslim scholars have not met and, and discussed and agreed upon something. They not all look to the matter and given given the same ruling, then the mushtahid has to do ishtihad, meaning the scholar who is qualified to do independent personal reasoning, who can look at the evidences and study the matter in depth and come to a ruling. Then that's what he does. He does ishtihad, and then he attaches one of the two rulings to it, i halal or haram, based on evidence in the revealed law. The two sheikhs continue. They say it is from wara is from carefulness to leave off doubtful matters, such as not transacting or dealing with a person whose wealth has doubt. Someone who is, they're, they're, meaning the source of their income or the income, the money that they deal with, is doubtful. There could be some uh, riba involved, some user involved, there could be some money from gambling, there could be some buying and selling of intoxicants or something else. Uh, another example is someone who 
uh, someone who uh, has mixed his wealth with usury, one would, want, one would want to stay away from that. One want to be careful of that, of, of transacting with such a person. The other example they give is to do to engage in in in, in uh, or to do a lot of, of things that are permissible but are better to be left off. So, for example, things things that they're not necessarily haram. They're not necessarily well. To be more clear, they're not necessarily mukru. They're not necessarily mundu. They're not something that you're recommended to do. They're not something that you're not told not to do. You know, if you do a little bit of it. It's okay, you know. For example, if you watch a bit of television or you play a bit of video games or, or you tell a few jokes or something like this, you know, that's that's okay in and of itself, right? They're, 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 technically, these things are halal, but if you do a lot of them, you know, you do it for half an hour, an hour, and so on and so on and so forth, then it can become, then you start uh, approaching that which is suspect, and it can become makru, and then it could get even worse and worse and worse because you start wasting time. You could be doing more beneficial things, and then it becomes the haram when it actually starts taking you away from your obligations, right? Just meaning that you do so much of something uh, lawful that gets to the point where you start missing your prayers, you start making yourself sick, you can't fast as a result. You have to think about these things. This is something to be careful of. Just because something is halal doesn't mean you can do as much as you want of that thing. Then they mention something else which is very important. They say, as for that which reaches the level of waswasa, i.e. satanic whisperings, such as declaring something unlawful that is really unlikely, this is not from the doubtful matters that one should leave off. An example of this would be to leave off marrying women from a large town out of fear that that person might be a mahram, might be someone that you are unlawful to marry. So, for example, if you have a sister... Uh, or a brother, and you had the same wet nurse. You're both uh, breastfed by the same woman, which means that you are uh, mahram to one another because of that. Because of that, you can't marry each other. If you know that that you don't know who that, let's say you don't know who that who that woman is. You don't know who that woman is, but you know that she lives in some city or some town. Like she lives in somewhere like Manchester or Casablanca or Cairo or New York or something like this. You wouldn't say to yourself, okay, I'm not going to marry any of the women from New York. I'm not going to marry any of the women from Casablanca. I'm not going to marry any of the women from Manchester because it might be her. No, that's that's just ridiculous. That's paranoia. That's not uh, wara. That's what, as, as the sheikhs say, that is wasosha shaitania. That's satanic whisperings. Whereas if we're talking about a small village or a hamlet where she could be one of five women or ten women, then you would want to be careful. Because it's a very, very small number. But if we're talking about a larger town where we're talking about hundreds of women, thousands of women, no. Then you're getting then then it's just being pedantic. Another example they give is using water in the desert or, or not using water in the desert because it might be negis, it might might have might be contaminated with filth. Again, this is a possibility. But it, just because it's a possibility doesn't mean it's definite. And, and and obviously, if you were not to use that water, you could actually harm yourself. So again, this is not wara. This is satanic whisperings. So the two sheikhs continue, and they say that the mushtabihat are aksam. So the ambiguous matters have categories. And they quote Ibn al-Mundhir and Nisabori, uh, who, believed in, who died in the year... Uh, uh, 318 H, and he says that the Mushtabihat fall into three categories. So the first thing is something that someone knows to be haram, and then he has doubt, doubts about it. He has doubts like, could it be halal or not? It is not permissible for him to approach that unless he has, unless he has certainty. For example, he has two uh, sheep that, he, that he, slaughters, he slaughtered one of them, but then he, and the doubts as to which one it is. So, if you find, if you have two dead animals, so this, this is the case, a man has two dead animals, he knows that one of them he slaughtered properly, and one of them he didn't. One of them was just killed, or one of them accidentally had his head chopped off, or whatever. The, also, we have to remember, the foundation of the matter is that an, a dead animal is haram. Any dead animal 
the default position is that it's haram. It's not lawful to eat. Unless we can ascertain that it was actually slaughtered properly in the way that Allah and his master have commanded, then we don't need it. So this is the situation this person's in. The thing's going to be haram. He can't ascertain which one it is that he slaughtered properly, so it's best to leave it off. Then we have the reverse of that. The opposite of that is that something is halal, and then one has doubts as to whether it is unlawful, such as one's wife, one doubts whether or not one divorced her. Again, the principle, and I should mention this, the principle here is a qa'id al it's, it's a fiqh uh, axiom or maxim. al yaqeen la yuzul bishak. Certainty is not removed by doubt. We always go back to the point of certainty. So, one's married. This, this, is, this woman is one's wife. Therefore, that is the point of certainty. That is the default position. And then one doubts as to whether or not, well, did I divorce her or not? That has no effect because certainty is not removed by doubt. They also give the example of whether or not one broke one's wudu. So if you are certain that you made wudu, you're like, I made wudu before Asr, I made wudu before the Maghrib, and I don't remember breaking it. I don't, I'm not sure whether I broke it or not. Well, what do you do? Do you go back to the certainty? The certainty is that you made wudu, and therefore you have wudu. The reverse also works. If you're certain that you broke your wudu, you're certain that you use the toilet, but you're not sure, you don't remember as to whether you made wudu after that, then what's the ruling? Well, you don't have wudu, because the point is certainty. And this makes uh, perfect sense. It's, it's, it's very similar to, to uh, for example, if you're lost and you're traveling, and you're trying to find your way somewhere, what are you going to do? You're going to go back to the last place that you remember from which you know where to go. So if you're trying to find your way home and you're trying to try, you're, you're taking a different way home one day, you don't, know, you don't know where you are, you get lost, you think, well, I, I do remember that I did pass by that gas station. I know my way home from that gas station, so I'm going to go back to that gas station. That's the same thing, the same thing here. Um, another example that comes up, which they have not mentioned, uh, in acts of worship, for example, if you're praying... And especially if this happens in the longer prayers like Dhuhr uh, and Asr and Isha, which are four raka'at, if you have doubts as to whether you've prayed two raka'at or three raka'at, you know, am I in the third raka'at or the fourth raka'at? What do you do? You build uncertainty. If you don't know whether you're on, whether you've done uh, two raka'at or three raka'at, you've definitely done two. In both cases, you've done two, so what do you do? You build on two. Same with uh, Tawaf. If you are doing Tawaf on the Kaaba, and you were not sure how many rounds you've done. Have I done five? Have I done six? What do you do? You go back to five. You build on certainty. Always go back to the certainty and build from there. Then the third category that Ibn al-Mundhir rahimahullah mentions, he says that there are some things that one doubts equally as to whether they are haram or halal. So you're 50-50 here. It could be halal, it could be haram. The best thing here, uh, uh, the best thing here, is to just refrain from it. You're 50-50. It could be halal, it could be haram. It's best to refrain from it. And this is what the Master of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, did regarding some dates that had fallen, and this is related by Imam Al Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, that the Master of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said, he said, I turn, I turn to my family, and I find a day that has fallen on the bed, on my, on my bed. And I raise in order to eat it, and then I and then I fear that it could be from sadaqa, so I drop it. And again, if you look in uh, Sahih Muslim or Shar Sahih Muslim, the, the commentary by, by Imam Noe, he says that this is from this we learn that sadaqa was forbidden for him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that he did not distinguish between the sadaqa that is obligatory, which is zakat, and the sadaqa that is merely recommended, which is any other sadaqa. Because he used the term al sadaqa meaning alif lam. So the word sadaqa in the hadith, because he said, thumma akhsha and tukun min sadaqa, this refers to both, zakat and sadaqa. And this is the evidence that the uh, sheikhs are using to show that if something is half and half, could be halal, could be haram, it's a 50 50 situation, it's better off to leave it. The next thing the two sheikhs go into is they talk about the statements of the Salaf regarding leaving off shubuhat. So the first statement is from Abu Darda, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. He says that perf the perfection of taqwa is that the slave has taqwa of Allah such that he has taqwa regarding 
an atom's weight, mithqal al And when he leaves off some of what he sees as halal out of fear that it could be haram, and therefore that is a barrier between him and the haram. Al Hassan al Basri says that taqwa remains with the muttaqeen such that they leave off a lot of the halal out of fear of the haram. And then, uh, then they quote Sufyan al Thawri, who says that they are called muttaqeen because they have taqwa, or they, they, are, they, they are wary, they are cautious of that which is not normally, uh, people are not usually cautious of. They are wary of things that people are not usually wary of. And it's been related on the authority of Ibn Omar, who said, he said, Inni la uhib, and adabaini wa bin al-haram sitra, that I love to put between myself and the haram a veil. I mean, and it's a veil that I a veil of the halal. I like, put, I love to put, I love to put between myself and the haram a veil of the halal that I do not violate, that I do not rent asunder. Sufyan uh, ibn Uyayna said, "A slave does not achieve the truth or the reality of faith until he puts between himself and the haram a barrier of the halal." such that he leaves off sin and that which resembles it. It has been established from Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that he ate something doubtful and he didn't know that it was doubtful. And then when he learned about that, he put his finger in his mouth and he vomited it out. It was said to Ibrahim ibn Adham, Do you not drink the water of Zamzam? He said, If I had a bucket, I would drink. And this means that the bucket was from the wealth of the Sultan. And again, if you refer back to Kitab uh, al-Halal al-Haram by Imam Ghazali, there are several examples of uh, the ulama and awliya avoiding the wealth of the Sultan as much as possible. So if it's something that the Sultan has built, if it's, uh, if it's a canal, if it's a bridge... Uh, anything like this, they're avoiding using it, avoiding benefiting it because of the doubtful nature of it. Because they're thinking, well, where does the sultan get his wealth from? Some of it could be lawful. Some of it could be uh, from from uh, uh, ghanima and so forth. But so, I mean, from the spoils of war and uh, and, and and money that's put put in towards towards the bait, bait al-mal, money that's gathered from lawful sources, or it could be from unlawful sources. And Imam Ghazali has a whole chapter on this where he labels all the sources, all the potential sources of where a, a ruler or a government can get its money from. And he always advise, he does he himself advises that it's always best to avoid taking money from that source because there could be some oppression or something unlawful involved. So this is what you're going to find. This is, this is the position of Ibrahim and Adam. And if you look in Kitab al Haram, the book of the lawful and the unlawful, there are uh, several examples of this. The two sheikhs continue, and they say, May Allah be pleased with the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and may Allah have mercy on those who follow them with ihsan from the Salaf al-Salih, i.e. the first three generations, who distanced themselves from doubtful matters, and they secured their deen completely. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu sam ar rasulillah So that is enough, I believe, for this week. We're approaching 24 minutes, and inshallah, when we come together again for episode 18, we will do the pastorage of every king, and we will talk about uh, rectifying the heart. And with Allah alone is every success. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.